Oh, yeah. Sophomore wide receivers. We get a lot of breakouts at this position in this season. Welcome, everybody. February 29th. Holy cow. Adam Azer here with Dave Richard and Professor Jamie Eisenberg is back. Uh, good. Welcome back, Professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You're so smart. Can you tell me anything that happens once every four years other than today? Other than February 29th. Every four years, there's a presidential election, Olympics. Hey, there you go. That's one. Olympics. Oli yeah. Oh, I forgot about Olympics. Yep. Um, Summer Olympics. Um, well, winter too. Winter's, winter's every four? Or every two? It's winter's every four years, summer's every four years, but they stagger them, so they're two years apart. Gotcha. All right. So winter and summer Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, every four years. Um, ole, 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 ole. Up. You, you, uh, you shower. I shower. <laughs> That's four weeks, not four years. And uh, the only other thing we came up with was that uh, first round or non first round picks in the NFL draft become free agents. But anyway, welcome to a very special edition, a February 29th edition of Fantasy Football Today. Uh, yeah, last year was really a great year for rookie wide receivers. And Puka Nakua was the 20th wide receiver selected in the draft. He is the first wide receiver to lead all rookies in fantasy points and not be a first or second round pick in the last 10 years, I believe. I'm just looking at this now because I know I had this in a, in my NFL draft notes, but it's almost always one of the first six wide receivers selected, and it's almost always a first or a second round pick who's the best rookie wide receiver. Puka Nakua destroyed that last year. Um, we'll do some fill in the blank. That's just the last 10 years, or that's just what you have is the last 10 years? No, the, I think the last guy who finished as the number one fantasy rookie that wasn't a first, second, or third round pick was Victor Cruz in PPR in 2011 and T.Y. Hilton in non-PPR in 2012. But he was a third round pick, but he was the number 13 wide receiver drafted. Um, it, it, it's, been, it's been, I think, nine straight years before Puka that the best rookie wide receiver was one of the first six drafted. Beckham, okay, that makes Cooper, sense. Yeah. Beckham, that Cooper, sense. Michael Thomas, Juju, Calvin Ridley, A.J. Brown, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Garrett Wilson. So... That's usually what it is. Puka was a, a big time exception to the rule. Uh, Gee, David, I wonder who it'll be this year. <laughs> uh, but it's going to be a really exciting uh, rookie class anyway. But anyway, in terms of the sophomores, Dave, looks pretty good, huh? Great. And and you knew it coming into the year. I mean, forget about Puka. We didn't expect Puka to do what he did. And he just landed in the exact right situation. But four wide receivers, all of varying talents were taken back to back to back to back in the first round. Uh, I would say that two of them were good. Two of them were pretty terrible. And there's still room for optimism for all four of them to do at least as well as they did in 2023. And there are plenty of other receivers that were taken after round one that have a chance to at least have a serviceable role, if not become the number one wide receiver for their teams. That would obviously include Puka. Jamie, what are your thoughts overall? Um, and what I think is so interesting is that, you know, the first round, you had those four guys go consecutively. You had JSN, Fla I don't remember the order, JSN, Flowers, Johnston, Addison. Um, yeah, we're optimistic about three of those guys, but then you got really the guys later, Puka, obviously Tank Dell, uh, depth later in the class, kind of an interesting sophomore class. Well, I, I think it's more fascinating, the, the guys later in the class, clearly, as, as you know, um... You alluded to with with Puka Tank Dell clearly was a was a star when he was, you know, healthy. Um, you know, you saw what uh, Rashi Rice was able to do. Clearly, not just a first round pick, but you know, a, a relatively high draft pick. Yep. Um, Jaden Reed and what he was able to accomplish. You know, in in not being as highly touted as those first four guys. Uh, and then we had some guys that had some you know interesting moments like Josh Downs, Demario Douglas. You know, those guys had some some good games you know not necessarily good stretches of games but good games and certainly had a lot of optimism so there, there's a lot to like about this group uh going into next season you know and and hopefully you know the the two guys like dave said that weren't as good because i think you could say addison and flowers were, were successful for rookie wide receivers they just weren't dominant like some of these other guys uh but the hope would be is that you know jsn gets the opportunity we're waiting for and and quentin johnson is going to have a big opportunity 
most likely if they move on from Mike Williams or even Williams not coming back at 100 percent that he can step up and be a big time contributor as well. So this this class could be something uh, this class could be a group that we're talking about for many years to come. I hope so. All right. So I want to talk about just this is the first time every year that I get to talk about this stat, the 900 yard stat. And it's rookies who gain 900 yards. They usually have great careers, honestly. I mean, the, you know, or, or at least good careers. So now going into 2012, not including last year's class, as we don't know how they're going to finish, obviously, in their second season. Um, we've had 30 wide receivers in the last 20 years from 2003 to 2022. 30 rookie wide receivers reached 900 yards. 20 of them scored more fantasy points in their second season than they did in their first season. And among the 10 that didn't, it's not like they were busts necessarily. Michael Thomas had a great sophomore season. He just had a really great rookie season. Jamar Chase missed five games, so he's on that list too. There's, there are only a few players that got 900 yards that are just outright busts for their career. Guys like uh, Michael Clayton, Eddie Royal, Mike Williams of Tampa Bay. Then you've got the next group would be guys maybe like uh, Juju Smith-Schuster. You know he had he had a fourteen hundred yard season, but he wasn't he hasn't he's been kind of a bust, I guess. Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf, but basically you get nine hundred yards. It's almost like the worst case scenario is DK Metcalf, Terry McLaurin, T Higgins, um, something like that. And three guys did it last year: Puka Nakua, Rasheed Rice, and Jordan Addison. Okay, I don't have much to say about that, so let's go to some fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. Puka Nakua should be a top blank pick in twenty twenty four drafts. You're taking him first overall. First overall? Yes. Love him that much. <laughs> um, he should be a top, top 15. 10. Ooh, I think 10. he went 10th in the draft we reviewed yesterday. Somewhere around there, 10th or 11th. Yeah, in that range. Okay, the uh, the Whoa. second sophomore wide receiver off the board should be blank. Rashi Rice. Yeah, that would be the one. Right now. Yeah. Right, so to go go on about right now. And by the way, is it the same? So I think it's either going to be Rice or Tank Dell for most people. It's probably going to be Rice. But but what if it's a half PPR league or a non PPR league? Does that change? And then what in terms of the NFL draft or free agency would change your mind there? I don't care about the format because he's proven to be a touchdown magnet in terms of Rice. So that's not going to be a detractor for me. But I, I think in terms of uh, free agency in the draft, clearly the Chiefs they've already made one move to move on from MBS. You know they're going to go hopefully be aggressive at that position for the sake of Patrick Mahomes, but for the sake of Rashi Rice, it's going to be a detriment if they bring in, let's say, a Mike Evans or if they're able to somehow pry away one of the franchise tagged receivers in a trade because um, Michael Pittman is going to get tagged based on what Chris Ballard said yesterday. Uh, so, you know, you could be looking at an, an Evans, Gabriel Davis, Marquise Brown type of free agent signing, Calvin Ridley free agent signing. That would impact Rice clearly, whatever you think of those guys. And then if they're aggressive in the draft as well, so, you know, you could be looking at as many as three receivers coming into the Chiefs if if uh, if things go probably the way that they would like it to. And one of those, if not two of those, could be some prominent guys. All right. Rasheed Rice was the, in his last six games of the season, he was the number six wide receiver in half PPR, number four in full PPR. Per game, he was 12th in half PPR and eighth in full PPR. He was on pace for 159 targets in those last six games. Then in the postseason, and this was kind of a concern of mine thinking about Rasheed Rice. Well. He did a lot of that damage in the second in those last six games. And Kelsey, Kelsey was not Kelsey. So, but what about in the playoffs? Kelsey was very much Travis Kelsey, and Rice was still on pace for 111 catches, 1,114 yards, only four touchdowns on 140 targets. That's still amazing for a rookie in the postseason. Um, the okay, let's do a sleeper, a breakout, and a bust among the second year wide receivers. My favorite sleeper is blank, Dave. I think my favorite sleeper is going to end up being Jalen Hyatt, who is profiling as certainly a deep threat for the Giants, but also somebody who could develop and be a little bit more than that. I, I was impressed with some of his flashes, certainly liked him in college at Tennessee, even though he didn't run a full route tree, but he should have an offseason where he works on his routes a little bit more, maybe puts on a little bit of weight. I know we talk about that and say that that's a bad thing, more so for running backs and wide receivers. But I think that Jalen Hyatt does have potential. And when I look at him, 
I think about him as a sleeper, somebody that I'm taking late anyway. So if the first three weeks of the season come and he doesn't do anything, Daniel Jones isn't connecting with him, then forget it. I'm out. But I do like the idea of getting him on my bench. All right, Jalen Hyatt. Jamie, who's your favorite sleeper? Uh, Demario Douglas. You know, I, I think you see the uh, the Patriots receiving core is pretty abysmal right now. And he's got the chance to be hopefully their second guy. They're going to go out and get somebody, whether again in the draft or free agency. And uh, they should because they're going to get a young quarterback and hopefully build around that quarterback. But I think Douglas is going to be locked into one of their top three roles, hopefully their slot role. And uh, I could see him being one of these guys that we hyped up a little bit at times during his rookie campaign and having a sophomore breakout. All right. How about speaking of breakouts, then my favorite breakout sophomore receiver is blank. Me? Sure. Whoever. Uh, Smith and Jigba. That's the obvious one. I mean, you know, you just want to see him get the opportunity that we've been waiting for and, you know, taking advantage of it because I think he will. You know, we saw at times last year when when Metcalf was banged up or Lockett was banged up, you know, he stepped up and in, in a bigger role, certainly when he was playing on the outside. Uh, had a chance to be a very successful fantasy option, and I think that's going to be the case this year. Tyler Lockett's 31. Would make sense that they move on from him or at least put him in a reduced role if he does come back. Uh, but obviously, JSN, you know, when you asked who's the second receiver, second sophomore receiver that could be drafted, would not be surprised if the Chiefs add players and the JSN hype gets puts him ahead of, of Tank Dell, potentially. Um, he's got that much upside. Uh, all right, I'll go to Dave in a second, but let's talk about, okay, so Jackson Smith and Jigba, pretty underwhelming rookie season. He played 17 games, and he had 628 yards. He had four touchdowns. Jamie mentioned uh, playing on the outside. He was really confined to the slot, almost two-thirds of his snaps, maybe more like 60% of his snaps. And I noticed, I think I said this last week or whenever, uh, the three games with his highest percentage of, of snaps on the outside were his three highest yardage games of the season. Uh, so, yes, I... I'd love to see Tyler Lockett gone. I'd love to see JSN playing on the outside. But what if he's not? What if it's the same? What if it's just rinse, repeat? You know, can he really break out? Can he really have a, even a 1,000 yards, which would be a pretty big jump from 628? I don't think he, he'll he be a breakout candidate if if Tyler Lockett's there. But he still could have a 1,000-yard season and be more productive, you know, just because I think that they will start to put him in those situations to be more successful and give him more targets and give him more opportunities. I mean, it just makes sense. Again, you have a 30-year-old guy who is not part of their future. This is their future. You know, their their future for the next three to five years is DK Metcalf and JSN leading the receiving core. And yeah. so, you know, unless they're going to tank in 2024 to, uh, you know, get draft picks and find the next quarterback of the future – if they're going to be a competitive team and Geno Smith stays healthy, then I think JSN takes a step forward in some way, shape, or form. But to be a breakout, it's got to be with Tyler Lockett most likely gone. Dave, who's your favorite breakout at the position? I, can we call Jaden Reed a breakout? Can he do yeah. better than what he did this past season? He averaged over 13 PPR points last year, 13.6. His last eight games, 17.4 PPR points. I'd like to see him become the number one target for Jordan Love in Green Bay. I think he's the most versatile of the wide receivers that they have. I think he can do anything that they ask him to do. Is he as fast as Christian Watson? No. Is he as tall as Christian Watson? No. Can he be healthier than Christian Watson? Pretty much everybody can. And Romeo Dobbs has been good. He stepped up in the playoffs. That game against Dallas was amazing. But I'd, I'd like to see Jaden Reed become that main target and that number one guy. And I wonder if he takes the kind of step forward that Jamie talked about for JSN. But he, he I mean, he kind of already did last year but he could do it again and take that next step and finish the year as a top 12 wide receiver. All right. I want to give me a moment here. I just look up the stats for Jaden Reed. Well, with... you could just put him in my next uh, category. Oh, you're going to call him a bust. Yeah. He was awful when everybody was healthy. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I just looked at the playoff games. He had like four targets in the playoffs or something. Or maybe seven. I think he was was every I time Christian that, Watson was, was out, seven targets. Oh, every he time did. Christian Watson was out. He was a superstar. Yeah. I think but at the same time, I mean, great, great advanced metrics, uh, or good at least. I think we're going to talk about him on Beyond the Box score. Good season. Watson gets hurt all the time, right? You know, it's like it's like the 49ers. It's like, well, they're all when they're all healthy, but they're never all healthy. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. What Dave said, he he definitely has the most upside of the group. But unfortunately, if you're just looking at what he accomplished last season, everything for him was perfect when everybody was when when somebody was missing. Mostly Watson. When Watson came back, his numbers went to tank. Okay. 
Uh, all right, and Dave, who's a bust for you? Uh, so wait, all right, hold on. So Jaden Reed will be a bust. That's what Jamie's saying. Uh, when would you draft him? What do you th- like? What do you think his value should? I be? would draft him as early as round seven. Okay, Dave. Yeah, how- get it done. Right, but I don't think he necessarily could. No, he went. Me? He went higher than JSN in our first two PPR mocks, and JSN. But that won't be the case if Lock at the six seven turn. No, that won't be the case if Lockett's gone, right? right. Uh, Dave, who will be a bust for you? It's the same kind of argument that Jamie made for Jaden Reed, but I'll do it for Jordan Addison. In the first five games of this year, Cousins was there. Justin Jefferson was there. He averaged 12.4 PPR points per game. When Cousins was on the field and there was no Justin Jefferson, it's a small sample. It's three games, 21.5 PPR points per game. That's what I think fantasy managers, they remember those games. When Jefferson wasn't around, Addison worked as the number one guy. He was awesome. But if Jefferson's there, if Cousins is back, I'm a little worried about that target crunch hitting Addison and him maybe being a little too overdrafted. Yeah, okay. I think the thing that benefits Addison hopefully tremendously is, is TJ Hawkinson not being there for the start of the season. And so that should be a huge advantage depending on how long Hawkinson is out. I, I think Addison's going to have a, another solid sophomore campaign. I don't think people are drafting him based on those three games. I think they're drafting him based on what he did with Cousins and what he did when Jefferson's there. I think if anybody's looking at those three games, they're making a huge mistake. Right, but then we're looking at the five games with Cousins and Jefferson, and he had some good moments, no question, but still, 12.4 PPR points. Is that a round five wide receiver? Well, it's a round five wide receiver projecting him to get better in his sophomore season. That's what anybody should be doing. I right, think they can do that for all these guys. Well, yeah, I mean, they are they a lot of them are going to get better. Remember, he's one of the 900 yard guys. And in those five games, Jordan Addison, we're talking about here in those five games, TJ Hawkinson had, let's see, 20, 39 targets. So that I would be a little worried about Addison, uh, you know, being like a top 15. Let's let's compare him to T Higgins, right? Because you're you're hoping for. Jefferson is Jamar Chase and Addison is T Higgins, a really solid number two. Um, I'd be worried about it if Hawkinson were healthy. In fact, I think it would be pretty hard to accomplish because usually when you see two top 15 wide receivers on the same team, there is not a third guy taking a lot of targets. That's why I was a little worried but about you think the people are drafting Addison as a top 15 receiver. No, no, but I think you're no, not at all. But I think you're hoping that he gets there, right? You're, you're drafting him, hoping that he can be, like why shouldn't why should I not draft Jordan Addison thinking oh he could be the next Devontae Smith he could be the next T Higgins yeah you mean I you, you, you I should think you want to you want to hope for that but if you're drafting him that way then you're making a mistake no absolutely not I'm just talking about his upside and I do think that's his upside but I think Hawkinson would limit it but I'm not expecting a ton from Hawkinson especially earlier in the year so I I think if Cousins comes back and it's it's Jefferson Addison and either a, a Hawkinson on IR for a bit or a, or a coming off the ACL I think I think. Addison could be great. You know, I'm I'm optimistic about it. no, you don't draft him as a top 15 guy, but you should at least be thinking, does he have that upside? And to me, the answer is well, how much is TJ Hawkinson playing? How good is he? How many targets is he getting, basically? And also you have to ask that about cousins. You, you yeah, understand I, what I, I love the setup for him if cousins is healthy. Right. Um, all right, we got to take a break. And I I think we got to bring up Zay, Zay Flowers in this discussion too. Is, does he have bust potential? Because he's going in the fourth round in our drafts right now, and he did most of his best work when Mark Andrews was injured. So we'll talk about that after this quick break on Fantasy Football Today. We need your sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ, anywhere, anytime, all the time. So if we look at the top four guys in the NFL draft last year, I know who's going to be fourth for you. It's going to be Quentin Johnston. How would you rank the other three right now? That would be JSN, Zay Flowers, and Jordan Addison. Flowers, Addison, JSN right now. And none of them top 24. Flowers wide receiver. But Flowers, Addison, JSN, that's that's what you said? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, so what do you think about Flowers? Kind of a similar situation to Jaden Reed. Oh, he really took off as soon as Mark Andrews got hurt. Um, your thoughts, Dave? It's it's the exact same thing. Because when Andrews got hurt, look at it. There's 
four games that Flowers had where he had at least 19 PPR points. And we were throwing out week 18 because he didn't play and Lamar didn't play in that game. I, I, I think that he's an incredible talent. It's just a matter of how much volume will this passing offense have and how many targets is Mark Andrews going to continue to take away. And then for whatever it's worth, and we talked about it on our last show, the whole Rashad Bateman thing and how John Harbaugh is talking up Rashad Bateman now as being a big part of that offense. That might mean three or four targets per game. I love the talent. I just don't want to overrate it because he finished last season super strong. It was with Mark Andrews on the shelf. Jamie, any concerns about Zay Flowers? You have him in your top 24, you said? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously reason to be a little concerned. Rashad Bateman's definitely not one of them, though. I don't no. care what John Harbaugh says about that. Um, I, I think that's the next evolution of just continuing to, you know, buy into Lamar Jackson and buy into Todd Motkin is that, you know, you see the development of one of their top stars, and that's what Zay Flowers is. And so, you know, Andrews is going to continue to be productive, but I don't think this is the same Mark Andrews that we're counting on to be that um, – you know, continue to, to to continue to be the the only focal point of the passing game, like we've seen in in Greg Roman's system, uh, for example. So I, I think Flowers can continue to grow and continue to get better and continue to blossom, and uh, I think he's got the upside to be an absolute superstar. Now, here's one other thing that we should bring up: in those games that Andrews missed, Isaiah likely had a pretty significant role. It's a great point. Likely had at least eight PPR points in every single game. He had three games with at least eighteen PPR points. In those three games with at least 18 PPR points, Zay had at least 19 in two of them. And he was a dud in one of them. So uh, even though there was no Andrews, here's another tight end in this Baltimore offense. He didn't, I don't think he got the same amount of targets. No, I can tell you that. Because I, I did it either. No, but, I, I, I have those numbers. And let me tell you before you go on, me, right? Me, me. In those last seven games of the season, and I believe that includes the postseason for uh yeah, for Zay Flowers. That's that was his best stretch. Uh, likely was really good. He was on pace for 12 touchdowns, but only 78 targets. Mark Andrews was on pace for 111 targets in his healthy games. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah, but I mean, likely was great, but uh, he wasn't nearly as involved as Mark Andrews. And uh, Flowers had a 19% target per route run rate with Andrews on the field, 22% target per route run rate with Andrews off the field. His target share went from 22.3% with Andrews on the field to 25.4% with him off the field. And both of those target share numbers are good. Like, I'd be happy with a, a low-end number two, high-end number three wide receiver. Let's call him a high-end number three wide receiver who's getting over a 20% target share. But with one of those tight ends being on the field, being Andrews, it really wasn't amazing. The fantasy production wasn't great. Here's a gross scenario to think about if you've got, say, Flowers, say, on a dynasty team. Hmm. What if Andrews and Likely end up having regular playing time together and this offense morphs into a 12 personnel type of system as they move forward? Because they can easily mix and match and create problems for defenses with Likely, with Andrews. Essentially, will Likely be one of their top five skill position players going into next year? there's a realistic possibility that the answer to that is, yeah, he will be. And that could hurt. It's just another mouth to feed in that offense. However big it is, that could take away from Flowers. Well, I, I don't. to be honest, I don't think that matters because it's, it's, if it's not a second tight end, it's a third receiver. It's a second receiver. No, it's a third receiver. Well, who are the first two receivers? Well, Bateman and... Likely might be better than Bateman. Oh, I'm not disagreeing with you. But what I'm right. saying is whatever personnel groupings that they do, if it's not two tight ends, it'll be three receivers on the field. So that third receiver or second receiver, if you want to put Bateman in the third role, will still be probably getting as much targets as Isaiah likely does. I think the difference is in a, this two tight end set, you've got a receiving tight end, un, unlike, you know, like a Dawson right. not something. But this is yeah, also but after, what they're, after what Harbaugh was saying this week about, you know, buffing up their offensive line. I don't think they're going to go with uh, two um, non-blocking tight end type of options. And likely well, certainly cable blocker. Not that Andrews isn't, but and, and let's not forget the Ravens had the third fewest pass attempts in football last year. So that's what really jumps out to me. And I always talk about how it's ho so hard to be a top twelve wide receiver on a team that's bottom five in pass attempts. But Did don't expect to him to be top twelve. That's the thing. I know, but I, I I'm not saying you draft him as top twelve, but I'm not drafting a guy in the fourth round that I think has very little chance of being a top twelve wide receiver, which I don't think is necessarily I'm, I'm not sure where I'm at on Flowers. I think he's really damn good. And I don't think it, in this offense he's got top 12 potential. 
Yeah, I mean, probably not right? because they just don't throw enough. But what if they start throwing more? What if they have like the eighth fewest pass attempts in the NFL? Then he absolutely has a chance. That's a different story, yes. Right, yeah. but I don't think that's something that we should expect from them. Just probably not. That's not going to happen. I, I think Flowers might end up being like kind of like Tyler Lockett. Like what was your view of Tyler Lockett before this year? Was he consistent? Not really. Was he somebody who could get you – he could help you win a week once every four weeks. And then the other three weeks, he's like around 11 or 12 PPR points. It's not going to kill you. I bet that's what Zay Flowers will end up being. If I'm confusing everybody, I, I just want to bring this up and feel free to question me on it, right? I know that Zay Flowers is not going to get drafted as a top 12 wide receiver. However, if you're investing a fourth or a fifth round draft pick, I do think you need to ask, does he have top 12 upside? Same thing right. with Jordan Addison. He may not be a top 15 wide receiver on, in drafts. He won't be. But I think there's such there's such a big group of wide receivers that, you know, such a big tier. You, you need to be asking, does this guy have top 15 potential? And, you know, that's why I never draft Terry McLaurin. Like, I would probably draft, look, we'll see what happens with them, right? We'll see who's brought in and, and whatnot. But I'd probably draft Jordan Addison ahead of Terry McLaurin. I mean, but McLaurin you're, probably- you're talking about round five type of players. I don't think anybody yeah. should be drafting these guys in the first four rounds. And so for round five type of players in a three receiver league, the way most educated fantasy players are drafting right now, that's your third receiver. Yeah, that's fine. But I still want a third receiver who has a lot of upside. And I think Addison. Yes, but but again, you're 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 looking at it, I think, from the perspective of when you're assigning the round value to it. I don't want to speak for you, but. Um, you, you're talking like wide receiver 20 to 25 and beyond at that point, you know? So it's not exactly like you have the ability to say, I'm taking these guys over players with what most people are going to consider have more upside. I say that <laughs> I, I got lost there and say that again. You're, you're talking about a group of receivers. I know you said it's a, it's a big bunch, but I don't think people are going to be comparing these guys to, receivers that are going to be drafted in the top 15 through 20 group. No, no, not at all. You're comparing them to the guys being drafted around them. So these are, we're actually looking at the draft we did last week. Jordan Addison was something like wide receiver 30, but the wide receivers going in round five were Calvin Ridley, Drake London, Terry McLaurin, Jordan Addison, Jaden Reed, and Christian Kirk. So that's wide receivers 25 through 30. Yeah, that's that's a delicious place to get. Right, that's perfect for these guys. If if you get them that late, wouldn't you say they pretty much all have top fifteen upside? See, well, I don't know. I mean, I think Addison does. Does Calvin Ridley? Probably right situation. Yes, I don't think he's got top. Drake London. Yes, the right quarterback. If it's PPR, I'll say yes to London. Is Terry McLaurin with the right quarterback? Yes. Ah. Harder time saying yes to that one. Does Jordan Addison? With 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 a healthy quarterback, yes. And a bum tight end. Does Jaden Reed? Not with a healthy Christian so. Watson. No. Yeah, I'm. I struggle Chris- with that one. I I don't think he's got top fifteen. No. Is Christian Kirk? <laughs> Didn't you say top twelve before? I was hoping for that. Oh. I can still hope for that. Does Christian Kirk top fifteen? Yeah. If there's no Ridley back. And by the way, like if Watson misses half the season, like we're now expecting him to basically do every year, then yeah, <laughs> Reed does have that type of potential. Hey, you know what's great though? Sportsline is great. Please check out Sportsline. In season, there's tremendous fantasy content leading up to the season as well. Dave, Jamie, Heath, they all have content on sportsline.com. Uh, Jacob Gibbs has his Beyond the Box score column on Sportsline. And we, NFL Draft, you want to get ready for the NFL Draft, you want to make some wagers. It's a great betting site. We give you picks on every game with a computer, with expert picks, stuff like that. So if you want to join Sportsline and get an amazing deal, 60% off on an annual plan, just go to sportsline.com slash join and use the code follow. The code is follow. I've gotten really great feedback from listeners who have said thank you for recommending Sportsline. It's really inexpensive for the money, for the value that you're getting. It's amazing. And 60% off, that's that's a ridiculous steal. Use the code FOLLOW when you sign up on sportsline.com slash join. I have a few news and notes here. And uh, the Rams signed Demarcus Robinson to a one-year deal. He had 
92 yards or a touchdown in five straight games down the stretch before playing just 39% of the snaps in week 18. And then he had 44 yards in one postseason game. So to Marcus Robinson, uh, does he should he get drafted in a 12 team league with say five bench spots? Well, if you I mean if you're going to rank the Rams receivers, it's Puka, Robinson, Cooper, Cup at this point. Um, uh, late round flyer, yeah, I think he can. I think he's got to be reserved for deeper leagues. The Colts are going to keep Michael Pittman. Jamie alluded to that earlier. The and remember, Dolphins- just keep in mind with the Rams that while Davis Allen's getting a lot of hype, they're going to be down Tyler Higby, so their offense may look a little different just in terms of scheme. Uh, the Dolphins want to extend to a tongue of Iloa and they expect it's, I had read a report that Teron Armstead was not going to retire, but now they don't know. And they expect a decision very soon before free agency kicks off in about a week and a half or so. They expect Teron Armstead to make a decision about retirement. That's their left tackle. And Jaguars head coach, Doug Peterson said he would consider giving Travis ETN fewer reps to keep him healthy. Dave, what do you think about that? He was a true workhorse last year, ETN. No, we want to keep him as a true workhorse. Certainly, he's a high-efficient running back. I love that they gave him work near the goal line. I would hate if they took that away from him. Maybe they just find a new change of pace back that takes seven carries a game, seven touches a game. Okay. Do you think that... Right, right. As long as, long as he gets the touches we want, then it's fine, right? The high-value touches. Well, I mean, between, between that and Todd Bowles saying something similar about Rashad White, it's just not fun. <laughs> like, don't don't say those things. No, and unfortunately, that it, it's so smart. Like fantasy managers hate it because no one wants to see every team have multiple running backs and have a one A and a one B and timeshare RBBC all that crap. But it makes sense for the teams to do that when they don't have a superstar. The problem is that we kind of view ETN as a borderline superstar. Rashad White put up numbers like a superstar. It's up to these coaches and, and what they, they want to do right by the player. They want the player to stay healthy all year. I get it. I just, I don't like it. it Jamie said it best. It's not fun. I don't mind it. Because yeah, maybe, maybe it's yeah. No, I, I I'm going to take everybody the- gets the same yeah. amount of time. Everybody gets 12 touches. I don't want that. I think exactly what you said, you spell him for seven, eight carries. If ETN just needs to be fresher. I look, he, he lost a yard per carry. Maybe he just was overworked. So I'd rather him, you know, be more effective as long as he's not getting losing the goal line touches and has enough catches. Just don't put him into block when he doesn't have to do anything. Fine. Yeah, fine. All right. Uh, back to the sophomore wide receivers. And let me just ask you a Puka Nakua question. Do you have legitimate concerns about Puka Nakua, who set the rookie record for receiving yards and, and receptions uh, with just an incredible year? Do you have bus concerns about him? I mean, I, I think any of these guys that don't have the pedigree, not to say that he didn't have a good enough college career, but clearly the NFL world did not feel that that was the case based on where he was drafted. And so did he just land, as Dave said, in the right system at the right time that maybe Cooper Cooper Cup, I was say Cooper Nicola, Cooper Cup has a little bit of a bounce back season or hopefully a big bounce back season for those people that are invested in him heavily. Um, because he's healthy and that takes away from, from Puka does the, you know, Demarcus Robinson signing indicate that, you know, he's not going to get as many targets. It's just hard to get away from what he did. Like he was just so successful and so productive and so much of a factor. I mean, like I said, I spoke to him at the pro bowl and, you know, it was, it was sort of a, you know, not a, not a joking question, but, you know, I asked him about the breakfast club, you know, I said, at what, at what point? Did you, did you start to sit in on those, on those meetings? And he said, you know, I just kind of invited myself and I, that's good. I I invited myself and I just kind of showed up and he said it was like a day or two. And they kind of looked over me and like, Puka, you're here. Um, (laughs) You know, and, but he just, you know, became a guy that Matthew Stafford and and Sean McVay could rely on. And there was that clip that circulated, you know, midpoint last season when he was really making a lot of, you know, plays, you know, week after week and uh, less need and, and, and Sean McVay, you know, saying that this was a guy that it, it was in the draft room, that this was one of the guys that they were targeting. They were going to be really pissed if they didn't get him. And so clearly they had a plan for him from from the get go. Uh, it was it was everything fell into place with Stafford staying healthy and having a bounce back season, looking like his old self cup getting injured. But, you know, you just don't want this to be, you know, you, you mentioned a name and, it, and it, it, it scares me a little bit. They're not the same player, but a similar type situation. Eddie Royal, remember his rookie season was 
um, I believe because if I'm not mistaken, it was it was Demarcus Robinson or uh, uh, the other guy. Um, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, the two receivers for Peyton Manning at the end. Um, and it wasn't. I don't even remember. It was Peyton. You were Manning. thinking of Demarius Thomas, not Demarcus Robinson. I'm sorry, Demarius Thomas and. Uh, was it? Decker at that point? Yes. Yeah. One of them got hurt, if I'm not mistaken. And, and that led to Royal being, you know, having the rookie season that, that, uh, that he, yet. His rookie year, I think, was with Jay Cutler. Yeah. I had that. So maybe I'm off. I don't know. Yeah. It, so, so when I see the guys who – I look at that list of the sophomore receivers. The guys who do worse – and Puka's probably going to go on the worst list. I mean, there's a good chance he's going to go on the worst list because he had the best rookie season, right? I mean, it was incredible. Six – number six wide receiver or number four wide receiver in PPR overall. But a lot of them had passing game downgrades. So Jay Cutler had a good year in Eddie Royals rookie season. Kyle Orton came in in his second season. Everything was worse. You see like Michael Clayton, I think whoever it was like went from uh, gosh, whoever the quarterback was had a good year, that rookie. Oh, whatever his name was. And then he was bad after Josh, that. Uh, Josh. Josh yeah. Freeman. Yeah. Yeah. Freeman. Right. Um, it was something like that. I mean, I might be mixing it up a little bit, but that, but that, I, I think if I have any Puka concerns, I don't know how you guys feel about this. It's Stafford. Yes. Saw, right. Like what 2022 looked like. That, ugh, and you know that he got beat up toward the end of the year. Uh, he obviously left that game against Dallas. Obviously he came back from that and he was fine. But that, if you're going to make a bus case for Puka, that's where you start is, well, will that offensive line be the same? And will Matthew Stafford be the same? And if Matthew Stafford isn't the same, how do you feel about the quarterback behind him? Could it be Carson once again? Could it be somebody worse? A lot of questions there, but it's not enough to make you want to head for the hills on Puka or downgrade him. You're not going to put him in, in the rankings behind Rasheed Rice or Tank Dell. I don't see anything like that happening. I think he's the number one receiver for the Rams. And by the way, there, I would argue that there's meat on the bone still. He had 16 red zone targets. He had 10 end zone targets. He scored six times. He was top 10 in explosive receiving rate. He was, I could cherry pick stats all day long. He was top 10 in basically every single stat among the rookie wide receivers in the class. And so I think that he can certainly pick up where he left off in an offense that's still going to have Cooper Cup on there. I don't know if Demarcus Robinson is going to keep up this thing of being the guy that takes the top off. There's going to be options there, and this offense hums really well with Stafford. So as long as Stafford's there, I think there's plenty of potential for Puka to continue picking up a 28% target per route run rate and being a very, very good fantasy wide receiver. Josh Freeman, by the way, was Mike Williams' quarterback, not Michael Clayton's quarterback, so I mixed up my my busts. We after are sucking on history. Today. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of stuff here, but... Um, That's yeah, not an right. economics professor, not a history professor. <laughs> all right, so we talked Puka, we talked with She Rice, Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, Jaden Reed. Some uh, we haven't really talked about Tank Dell. Huh. So, yeah, is he? He's clearly the third guy for you guys on this list behind Puka and Rice. As of now, Jamie Tank Dell. What you said? happened to Rasheed Rice? Yeah, is he clearly third for you, Tank Dell? Uh, as of now, yes. And it's not that far apart between Rice and Dell to begin with. So if Rice does get a lot of company, then Dell's the easy number two guy. Uh, the only thing like I'll go back to is would not shock me if JSN has just like a, a rocket strapped to his back and gets pushed ahead of these guys. But you could say you could easily make a case that Tank Dell was a lot better than Rasheed Rice. And in the yeah. games where he actually played, they both actually waited a while before they got good snap shares. But Tank Dell is explosive. He goes downfield. Rasheed Rice had the lowest A dot among 80 wide receivers with 50 or more targets. His A dot was less than five yards. Um, you know, that's it's hard to make big plays when that's happening. So you could make the case that Tank Dell is where it's at and not Rasheed Rice. Uh, you definitely can. I think you'd also make the case just based on where he's at in his career that Tank Dell's running mate is worse for him than Rice's running mate right now. Collins, I think, is is has the potential to do more damage to Tank Dell than Travis Kelsey does to Rashi Rice. Yeah, but but Tank Dell is a better quarterback. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, Tank Dell did some amazing stuff. Amazing stuff with a 15-yard A dot, which is a little too high for my liking, to be quite honest with you. But um, 
But, you know, th- ADOT's change a lot from year one to year two. You look at Jalen Waddle, for example, you look at Devontae Smith. These guys become different players, so we shouldn't pigeonhole them into the roles that they had as rookies. Okay, if there's nothing else to say about him, who do you want to talk about? We got Dontavian Wicks, Michael Wilson in Arizona, Jonathan Mingo, Trey Palmer for Tampa Bay, Marvin Mims, Dave mentioned Jalen Hyatt, Trey Tucker, A.T. Perry, um, Cedric Tillman, Jake Bobo. People like Jake Bobo. I like uh, Jake Bobo. He could be interesting if, if Lockett's gone, you know, stepping into that third role. Right. Uh, you mentioned a few names there. You, you mentioned a few names there. Um, I, I like what Sean Payton said about Marvin Mims, that they held him back. Uh, hopefully, we, you know, we see some changes in the receiving core from Mims' perspective, and that could, you know, open him up to a bigger role with a new quarterback. Um, Perry and, and Tucker are very interesting, you know, just with the, the chance of, for the, for the saints with, you know, new coordinator coming in and Clint Kubiak. And if Michael Thomas and Rashid, uh, Shahid are gone, both free agents, you know, does he get an opportunity to have a bigger role and maybe can be the number two receiver there opposite, um, opposite, uh, Chris Olave. So that's an interesting one. And clearly in, in, in Las Vegas, you know, they're going to have a new quarterback most likely. And, does Tucker take an, uh, take a step forward and maybe can become the third receiver there behind Devonte Adams and, and, uh, and Jacoby Myers. So there, there's a lot to like about some of these guys. Michael Wilson though, I think is, is in a different category. You know, he was, he was the other guy I was going to name if Dave had said to Mario Douglas, um, you know, we don't know exactly what this receiving core is going to look like for the Cardinals, you know, easy to, you know, sort of project that Marvin Harrison jr. Goes there at four, or if maybe, you know, one of the teams or a team jumps in front of them and, and, and they're staring at neighbors, maybe they go neighbors. Um, but, he's going to be one of their top three receivers. I would assume, you know, unless they just completely revamped the receiving court, Greg Dortch is gone. Not that he's a factor, but you know, with, uh, with Marquise Brown out the door, you know, Michael Wilson could easily be one of the go-to guys for, for us, for uh, Kyler Murray, which will be fun. What do you guys think about Josh Downs? I mean, could Good be the number two receiver PPR only nervous about high volume. If Anthony Richardson's the quarterback. Man, he had a great stretch. Weeks five through eight, 15.7 points, 13.1, 23.5, 14.2. And he did that against, you know, among those teams, Cleveland and New Orleans. So well, Cleveland he had the one big play to open the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Five catches, 125 yards, and a touchdown. He was a big playmaker, though, in college. I mean, he was terrific, explosive playmaker, Josh Downs. Um, yeah. I, I have a hard time getting excited about a number two receiver with a mobile quarterback. <laughs> But, you know, that's that's Josh Downs. He averaged 5.9 targets per game uh, in 13 games with Minshew. I, I think that I think he can get close to that with Richardson. Some weeks I'll have some seven, eight target games and some weeks I'll have some two and three target games. Anyone else? I, I mean, we got to talk about Quentin Johnston. Oh, right. I did sort of skip over. I, I, listen, I, I don't I don't mean to do this as like a fun thing. This isn't fun. I'd kind of rather hear about Professor Eisenberg's trip to Las Vegas. But Same, yeah. this is a this is a second year receiver who had a great profile coming out, went to a team. We love the fit and he completely fell on his face. And now it's like, what would it take for you to be excited about drafting Quentin Johnston? And the first thing for me would be it's round 14 and he's still on the board. I would be moderately intrigued. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic just because of the the potential changes that are there in terms of the receiving core. You know, you have – they have the opportunity to, I, I think, add someone. Like, for example, I'm, I'm writing today, um, you know, like just more, more having fun with it, but like ideal fantasy fits. And Marquise Brown to the Chargers makes a lot of sense because, you know, he had his best years with Greg Roman and, you know, there's there's a – you know, potential hole there with uh, Mike Williams coming off the books and maybe adding a a proven receiver to Justin Herbert. But if they don't, you know, go the veteran route and, you know, maybe just plug a hole in their receiving core because they're going to be a more run heavy team, then he has a huge opportunity in front of him. I mean, it's just, he's with one of the better quarterbacks. He, he, like Dave said, his profile coming out was good. It's unfortunate that he's, he's such a body catcher you know, with the way he, you know, goes, gets the football that he, and it's just not working for him. At least it didn't his rookie campaign, but he can have a a better sophomore season. I mean, he just, it just, the the vibes aren't great right now. So I don't think he'll last to round 14, but that's the sentiment is the later he's on the board, the better off you take a flyer on him and just hope that maybe he catches, you know, eight touchdowns, which I don't think would be out of the realm of possibility. 
know, it's a matter of what he does with the rest of the numbers. But, I mean, he's going to be a downfield threat. He's still got that big body. And for what it's worth, he was open a lot last year. So that's something that, you know, you can hopefully work with him to just do a better job of catching the football, which is something you would think is is the natural part of being an NFL wide receiver. But I, I'm, I'm still hopeful for him. Seven of his 67 targets were end zone targets. So at least they had the sense to try and use him that way. He only had two touchdowns on the year. But I, I, he could he make a jump? Yes. Is it likely that he makes a jump to where he's better than a number three fantasy receiver um, in a Jim Harbaugh, Greg Roman joint offense? Makes me tough. to. I, I have a hard time buying into it. But that's why you're going to get him late. I have a list of surprising year two wide receivers, guys who basically did nothing as rookies and then were good in their second season. Most of them were not good in their third season. But if you want to be hopeful, I think Kenny Galladay had a very quiet rookie year. He had 477 yards and three touchdowns. That was only in 11 games. So I guess that's right. He had a big week one and then kind of fell off. So, But that was 11 games. So that doesn't even work. Chris Godwin had 525 yards in 16 games. He followed that up with 842 yards and seven touchdowns in his sophomore season, which you'd sign is, up for that right now for Quentin Johnson. Yeah, I mean, because of the touchdowns, but it's, you know, it's 52 yards per game is not great. Then his third season, he was the number two wide receiver in fantasy. But there's really not a lot of, I mean, like Alan Hearns is on this list. Tyrell Williams, DJ Chark, Cortland Sutton. Cortland Sutton could be a guy to look at. Um, but Quentin Johnson's rookie season was so bad. 25 yards per game. Uh, that's alarming. It also, uh, you know, I mean, I don't think he would have done much, but it sucked that Keenan Allen got hurt when Justin Herbert got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, right. Could have seen that sample size. Sure. If, unless there's anyone else, I'll uh, let you guys go. Okay, you're gone. Have, have a great day. I'm actually going to talk to Jamie on it. Oh, oh the, the professor. How'd it go? It went really well. It went really well. Um, Vegas was fun. No surprise there. Uh, so it was good to get out there a little bit, see some friends. And the class was awesome. Um, they were they were a great group of kids. Um, we actually did a mock draft in the class. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Um, the, the professor, uh, his name is Dr. Eric Chang. Um, brilliant brilliant person um got a chance to meet him for the first time um and uh so the draft was actually his idea and so after i talked about you know my job and we talked about some of the numbers of fantasy football and stuff like that uh so we did the draft and so i gave him a rank list of, of players and he's not a, a football guy he uh he took the list and he put it in alphabetical order <laughs> so um, i'm handing out the list the the rank list to, to the <laughs> The kids of the class, I'm like, oh, this isn't what I sent you. He goes, oh, no, I alphabetized it. And so his, his thought was um, if it was just an order that the kids would have just drafted them in order. So we did a six-round mock draft. So they had to draft one quarterback, two running backs, two receivers, uh, tight end and flex. And uh, it was 10 teams, and the class paired up into groups so that there was hopefully somebody who knew what they were doing with some people that didn't. But really there was only, I think, three people of the of the 30 kids who were there. Um that uh, actually knew what fantasy football was. Wow. Oh, so, no, that's not good. Um, no, I mean, it's just, you know, it's it's interesting when you see people that don't really, you know, follow it and, and, and care about it. So the one, there was one young man who um, uh, really knew what he was doing. He said he's played in several leagues before. So he his team ended up with, it was him and, and, and a girl in the class. They ended up with uh, C.J. Stroud. This was, uh, um, the, the professor actually gave uh, three prizes to the top three teams. So it was a $5 gift card, a $10 gift card, and a $25 gift card to the winners um, based on my judgment. And the winning team was um, CJ Stroud, Jonathan Taylor, Ken Walker, Tyreek Hill, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I forget who the tight end was, not that it matters. Um, and that was the winning team. Was so like halfway through, he, he said, he, he, he goes, yeah, we won. <laughs> <laughs> was Devon Achan the uh, the first player on the list? Uh, Devon Achan, no. Well, they were uh, in alphabetical order by position, and uh, so um, one Allen. team actually, I think, I don't even know if it was on purpose, but ended up with uh, three Chiefs not named Kelsey. Kelsey was one of the early picks because Taylor Swift. 
Uh, but it was it was fun. You know, they 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 you know talked to a few of the kids afterwards. They were like, "Oh, I'm actually looking forward to the next year to play fantasy football." And um, they were they were really into it. So it was cool. All right. Is there an economics lesson that can be taught from the from the fantasy football perspective? Um, a lesson to be taught. I mean, I, you know, we talked about some of the numbers. Like, I, there's there's a um, uh, FSGA Fantasy Sports and Gaming Association survey that they did in 2022 that I referenced. There might it might be updated since then, but I I, I just kind of um, this is lazy student Eisenberg. Um, I used the the same PowerPoint presentation from the first time I did this at FAU, so I just used the same. Uh, I mean, we updated some of it, but we just used the same survey from the FSGA. So, you know, the amount of people who play fantasy, the amount of money that's that's put into fantasy, um, you know, the demographics of it, you know, those things I think were very interesting to that group, for example. Um, but in terms of like the game itself, I don't know if there's anything that an economic standpoint that you can. Let me ask a question a different way. How can I make $50 million <laughs> playing fantasy? Well, no, not a good question. All right. Uh, there was um, there was a young man in the in the class that's already working for uh, the Westgate Sportsbook. And so uh, it, it just sucked the timing of it. He invited um, me and uh, my friend, who's the FAU professor, to go check out the sports book afterwards and sort of, I think, like behind the scenes. And so I was looking forward to that, but we, were, we had a, our flight that night, so we couldn't do it. That, that would have been fun. Yeah. Did, did you, go did to you take theater? home as much as Pete took home? Did I take home as much as Pete took home? Yeah. I don't know if Pete took home. Okay. <laughs> did you go to the Sphere? I did go this year. Is that amazing? Um, we saw the uh, the 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 movie that they show there. It was really cool. Nice. All right. Well, I'm glad you're back, and thanks for your contributions. And everyone, uh, and J Jamie is uh, an ambassador of fantasy football, spreading it to uh, Las Vegas. Good stuff. Uh, Dave, Jamie, thank oh, you. Oh yeah, Las Vegas had never heard of fantasy. Yeah, football. Never heard. It was amazing. <laughs> it was really, an untapped market. Untapped market there. Uh, we're out of here. I should end the show uh, immediately. Talk to you on Fantasy Football Today in 5 if you want to hop over to that stream. Adios.